It's a pleasure to be here and I've enjoyed the presentation so far and the discussion. We appreciate your participation and your insights and input. Today I'm going to share a few thoughts about religious freedom advocacy and civility. Um, I, I'm not sure this applies only to lawyers. <laughs> Although goodness knows as lawyers we need it too. Um, I want to start with a video, if I can get this to work right. Can work. Do we have media people here? All right, well, maybe we won't start with a video then. Let's see. There we go. Oh, we need audio. Apologies, folks. Can someone get a media person real quick? Aha, I think I found it. Let's try this. Okay. No. a media person. Okay, let's try this. I'm having trouble getting the audio. Could you just, if you can do it quickly, we'll do it, otherwise we'll just skip ahead. I plugged this thing in here. Does that, that should work then. Well, then what do I do here? So you have to do it. Ah. Fabulous, you talk to the right person and all your problems are solved, right? Let's see. So this is me. My name is Arlo. This So this is me. My name is Alba. This is a true account of an experience that I had while shooting a video in Central Park. I was part of a group of strangers brought together to discuss civility and kindness. We're all on so the set. Team. Team. I mean, people can be so cruel. All sorts of discrimination going on. That's what you learn when you go to another place. Treat people, people the way you want to be treated. We were split into pairs and we all began discussing the various subjects. See, I see everybody, whether they're young, old, black or white, whatever gift? religion. No. I do feel it's a gift because I honestly believe everybody's born with the potential that they're a good person. Uh, yeah. I've been talking with the other people in the group. I remember looking over and I'd seen this homeless man. I remember thinking, Hmm, I do hope this man doesn't take my bicycle. <laughs> I actually was quite abusive to him. I wasn't very nice. I told him exactly what I thought about him. Gender. Just as we were wrapping up the last conversation, the director asked the person that I was speaking to to step out and asked the homeless man to step in. I was shocked. Still rolling. I was mortified. I was completely mortified by what he'd just done. Hello. Hello. What brings you here today? Oh, the weather. The weather? Yes. Like, if you hang around in the park, are people nice to you? Yes, very, very nice. So people say hello? Yes, I even get hugs. I even get a few hugs. Really? As a group, all morning, we've been discussing love thy neighbor, and yet I just turned on this guy and completely verbally abused him, and here I was now, face to face, having a discussion with him. And how do you feel about civility? 
I think it comes more from my heart, but a lot of people think it comes more out your pocket. <laughs> it doesn't take, it doesn't cost a penny to be, one cent to be polite. The world can be kind of cruel at times and, you know, you get confused and you don't know what to do, so you, you just start reacting. So what keeps you good? I think it's more ways to, to be good than bad. You know, we just don't exercise our, our the goodness that's instilled in us. No. There I'd been earlier, seeing all these lovely things, and I was a complete and utter hypocrite. From the moment I laid eyes on him, I judged Charles, I did. And he ended up being a completely different individual. He showed no ill will towards me, and he was talking to me as though we were best of friends. Ever since I spent that day with him, I said to myself, I am going to be a much kinder person. I hope people are inspired by the experience that I had in Central Park that day, that you will look at people just a little differently and understand that what one homeless man said in Central Park can honestly change your whole view on humanity. I like about that video is it reminds me of the fact that I have blind spots. That I like to think I'm a civil person, but there are times and places where I haven't always been. So as we talk about some of these issues today, I hope that we all keep that running around in the back of our head is sort of where are my blind spots? This all sounds good, all the principles are lovely. Where are the places where we fail to see our own behavior. Um, I want to start with a question about advocacy, religious freedom advocacy. How can it be effective? We want to make a difference. People are here presumably because they care deeply about the issue of religious freedom and want to be effective advocates. Well, let me start, I'll, I'll start with two cartoons. Those who saw my position last year so know that I love Calvin and Hobbes. This is one where Calvin's mother says, come on, Calvin, we're going to the store. And he says, can Hobbes come? She says, no, just leave him here. But I want him to come with us. And of course, he gets him. If you can't win by reason, go for volume. <laughs> you know, you can always try that. <laughs> Another option. I'll spout simplistic opinions for hours on end, ridicule anyone who disagrees with me, and generally foster divisiveness, cynicism, and a lower level of public dialogue. I think we've all seen a lot of that in some discussions recently. Probably not terribly effective, however. So what does make it effective? I mean, how can we make a difference on moral issues in particular? This is, these are issues people feel deeply about, touch the core of who they are, people's divisions and disagreements can be very, very deep and painful. Um, so how can one talk about this? I remember sitting on a plane once next to a lovely gentleman who I told him I worked with the Center for Law and Religion Studies. He was like, oh, that's charming. Two things that you never talk about in polite society, religion and politics. <laughs> so we had an interesting conversation about his profession. Um, well, there's been a lot of research done, and some of it's really interesting. I want to try and bring it up today. So I suggest that when we make moral decisions in our lives, they're not always logical, thought-out decisions. They're intuitive judgments. We try to, and then once we make those intuitive judgments, what feels right, then we come up with reasons afterwards, right? The, the examples where they did these studies with college students, and they did not just college students too, because as we heard today, they're not always a representative sample. But they would tr ask them some question that had moral connection ask them about incest or about um, eating food that's been contaminated. They'd take a bug and say, here, this has been perfectly sterilized. It's 100% clean. If I put it in this apple juice, would you drink the apple juice? 
would you drink it if I gave you five dollars? And then they tried to give logical reasons to the person after the person said, no, no, I wouldn't do it, and try and persuade the person. But often people weren't amenable to persuasion. Even though they couldn't articulate their reasons, they had this gut feeling that something's wrong with that. I'm just not comfortable with that. Um, and then they try and come up with reasons to explain their own gut feelings. What this really means is that moral judgments draw deeply on emotional reactions and processing. You have this moral intuition that's part of our nature as a human being. Um, one author has compared this to uh, an elephant and a rider. That the elephant is the emotional moral response. The rider, who's much smaller, does his best to control it, but doesn't really have as much effect when the elephant wants to do what the elephant wants to do, is the logical thinking processes that explain why you want to do what you want to do. Um, and he uses this image to try and show the relative power balance between our intuitive moral reasoning and our logical thinking. And so he asks the author, this is Jonathan Hy uh, Righteous Mind, fascinating book. When does the elephant listen to reason? The main way we change our minds on moral issues is by interacting with other people, right? Not logical explanations, not persuasion and debate. He goes on. When discussions are hostile, the odds of change are slight. The elephant leans away from the opponent, and the writer works frantically to rebut the opposition's charges. But if there's affection, admiration, or desire to please the other person, then the elephant leans towards that person, and the rider tries to find the truth in the other person's arguments. The elephant will lean towards friendly elephants. The elephant may not cha often change its direction in response to objections from its own rider, but is more easily steered by the mere presence of friendly elephants, or by good arguments given it by the riders or those friendly elephants. If we can be friendly elephants to other people, we are more likely to have an impact on how they assess moral issues. And I think you see that um, with what um, Professor Monson mentioned this morning about same-sex issues, that people's minds were changed because they knew people who were gay or lesbian, or you know, the contact theory that several people have mentioned. This idea that contact with people can change our emotional response to things. Um, one more Calvin and Hobbes comic, if I can read it right. Not my time for trifocals. Um, Hobbes says, I'm hungry, when's lunch? And Hobbes says, right now. Hi, Susie. Oh, look, you've got your stuffed tiger. Can I squeeze him? Are you crazy? Hobbes is a ferocious, man-eating jungle beast. Ferocious? He looks fuzzy and cuddly to me. Ha! Beneath that soft exterior lie terrible mandibles of bone-crushing death. He will grind you into hamburger. Each mighty paw hides razor-sharp claws to rip the living hide off any human that comes too close. He's a monster. No, he's not. He's a big cutie. Oh no, I can't look. So what happened to the mandibles of death you see for a ball? I was beguiled by her feminine charms. Yow. Go soak your head. So I think about practices. What does this mean as a practical matter? What can make a difference? Now, as I'm suggesting practices, the point here isn't to make a list and to memorize and to, to try to pair it so much. It's just to give a model of what it seems to me to be what we're all trying to do, to become people who are patient, kind, loving, don't take offense easily, are not irritated easily, have the pure love of Christ, right? This is something that's a process for all of us. And thinking through how this plays out in discussions and dialogue may help alert us to some of our blind spots along the way. So where do we start? Oh, one more comment. I just want to say that this is particularly true. I'm going to talk specifically about some of the very hard discussions we have um, with repeat players. So PTAs, school boards. Scott Farron talked about those. Um, city councils, state legislatures, people you see over and over again. Uh, families, Facebook friends. Um, 
I think these principles you'll see are, apply to other situations as well, but it's particularly um, apropos in these situations. So what can we do to have an impact in these kinds of scenarios? Well, first, we can engage in friendly interactions. Um, there's a lot of really interesting research that, uh, oh, it's moving on slides instead of, okay. That unity and good feelings between a group or among people in a group come through eating together and singing together. Um, I'm not proposing a religious freedom sing-in. Um, you never know, it might work too. But, uh, but one thing I've seen firsthand in my work internationally is the power that just sitting around a table with people has to break down barriers and walls for communication. It's harder to demonize someone that you know a little bit about and that you've talked with and shared food with. Um, there's also, I mean, a correlated flip side that studies show that isolation tends to feed public aggression. People get more vitriolic on the internet if they don't have a lot of human communication. Um, you know, I've seen this over and over again with different kinds of programs we do. One of the areas of my responsibilities is um, conferences and, and law reform issues in the former um, Soviet bloc area. And um, I've worked with many different people from both Ukraine and Russia, and they all got along great until about a little over a year ago. And uh, now, um, a year ago, shortly after the issues in Crimea and eastern Ukraine, um, we had a conference and people wouldn't sit down together. They wouldn't shake each other's hands. They stormed out of each other's presentations. There was very, very strong feelings about the issues going on in that part of the world. Um, and it takes time. But I have seen those same people sitting down and eating together and talking together. Um, and actually a couple of them have been singing around, sitting around when they were waiting for a bus and started singing folk songs together who are willing to have some kind of relationship and listen to each other. And then what I heard from them was, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to hear someone else's side of the story. Um, when they came into it very defensive, very argumentative. It's just harder to do that when you sit around a table and eat together. It has nothing to do with advocacy at some level, but it has everything to do with it in another. another step in this process of effective advocacy is seeing our role as being part of a conversation instead of being in an argument. We often take our cues from the media. Um, and if you listen to um, or watch television, listen to radio, you see news, you see political shows that value name calling, that value mocking, that value aggression, that value hard, hostile debate that's this echo chamber of feeding people who already believe that. Um, I, I don't know that there's anywhere in scripture that condones mocking as an acceptable way to be a follower of Christ. Um, you know, and some of this goes back, it goes really deep. We have this deep assumption that in any issue there's going to be two camps, that there's a debate and there's our side and their side. Um, and lawyers are certainly guilty of that. We um, are used to litigation where there's two sides of truth, where truth comes because two people are fighting it out. Um, and, but we forget that we have things in common, that this it has more than two sides, that it's part of a conversation. We can be true and their feelings can also have some validity and basis. And they may have ideas that we are overlooking. Um, I think it's a blind spot to assume that it has to be a debate between us and them, between two people, that that's the right way to deal with an issue. You know, people who've done intercultural communication studies raise something really interesting I hadn't thought about, that if you look at a lot of American news shows, there tends to be a debate between two people. But if you look at Asian news shows, there tends to be at least three people. 
And part of that is they have cultural norms that value saving face. And so in order to reduce the contention somewhat, they have at least three people. So there's someone who can um, build some commonality and agree and bring the group together. Um, there's more than one way to come at truth and a hostile, hard arguing debate won't likely move many elephants. Um, next step. Don't assume that you understand. We come in and we say, I know, I know people on the same-sex marriage side. I know people on the other side of the same-sex marriage debate. I know exactly what they think and why they're doing what they're doing. And usually what we know about them, or we think we do, is something very negative. Um, but it's very powerful if we start asking questions and just being genuinely curious about how they see it and why they see it. Um, interesting quote from a book about, called Difficult Conversations. One of the most common complaints we hear from people engaged in difficult conversations is that the people on the other side won't, the other, the other person won't listen. I have children, I know all about people not listening. Um, but what they go on to say is when we hear that, our standard advice is you need to spend more time listening to them. The reason the other person's not listening to you is not because they're stubborn, but because they don't feel heard. Then another quote, not all listening promotes effective communication. The type of listening that breeds connection is almost always related to a genuine desire to understand what others are trying to communicate. We don't listen to debate, we listen to understand. Listening, even if focused and energetic, that is mostly motivated by a desire to debate, argue, convince, or discount, is likely to lead to further conflict and distance. Not very effective advocacy. And it's something that we're all tempted to do. I want to jump. I'm listening to what you're saying so I can jump right in and counter it. Um, certainly in law schools, that's the model the teachers use. Um, not very effective. All right, well, let's see if I can do this. There we go. Another set of sociological researches that I think are really helpful is we try to understand how do we understand other people in these very difficult moral debates. Uh, we listen to them, even if we try to understand, sometimes we just don't get it. How can they say this is about liberty? This isn't about liberty, this is about families. How can they say this is about families? This isn't about families, this is about equality. It makes no sense to each other sometimes. We talk past each other. Um, I think the value of some of these moral foundations theory, this is very interesting, is that they identify six norms that they describe as almost like taste buds in the sense that everyone has them, but they're more, some are more developed than others in different people. If you think about this, you'll recognize it's true. So you'll have some friends that have different um, bases that they draw most strength from when they care about what's moral. So these, let me explain what these are and that'll help illustrate what I'm saying. One is care for victims of oppression. People think that it's valuable moral um, basis to have some concern. Now this plays out across the political spectrum, right? There's care for wounded warriors, there's care for baby seals, there's care for the environment. The sense that it's something is morally good because it cares about victims, or cares about people. Another one is the idea of liberty, that something's morally good because it allows freedom. You see this on all sides of the spectrum, right? Same-sex marriage should be about freedom. No, freedom means freedom from government. You know, we are both arguing about a common moral good. Uh, fairness, what does fairness mean? Is it fair to tax the rich? Is it fair to tax everybody at the same rate? Which one is fair? People may disagree, but they do have a common um, basis for foundations of their moral beliefs. Loyalty. Do we, do we lo owe loyalty to the organizations we belong to? Do we have a loyalty to our team? Do we have loyalty to people around us or to relationships? For some people, that's, you don't speak out against your country. You don't speak out against your church. You don't speak out against your group. The sense of loyalty or your personal loyalty to your child, your partner, that's a core basis of what you think is moral and right. And we all have some, we all have all of these. Authority recognizing the value of authority. Um, 
Is it religious authority? Is it academic authority? Where do you sense it? Where do you respect it? Uh, sanctity. Is it chastity? Is it sanctity of the earth? Is it sanctity of how we treat dead bodies? Right? People have different views on what makes something holy or sanctity, this value of sanctity, but everybody has all of these, and I would argue that God has these perfectly. Um, but what we, what we often see, at least in the U.S. context, is these often show up on ends of the political spectrum. The liberal moral matrix tends to put more emphasis on, on care and liberty and fairness. And you see this in the, the same-sex marriage debates, right? We want equality. We want freedom. We want concern for people who love each other or for children in same-sex marriage relationships. When conservative moral matrix tends to be heavier on the side of loyalty, authority, sanctity, marriage, tradition, traditional marriage, uh, religious authority. Right? We talk past each other because we're relying on different moral bases, even though at some level we acknowledge each other's moral bases. Um, when you start talking and listening, in many ways, it, that's what helps you into the next step. What I'd suggest is to empathize to acknowledge where people are coming from. It's hard to be an effective advocate if you can't acknowledge them because they won't get past how they feel if they don't feel listened to or acknowledged. Um, psychologists, I mean, I think the helpful thing is, I mean, we can't ever perfectly understand other people. Um, but psychologists tend to say that we're more interested in knowing that the person's trying to empathize with us than we are in knowing that they perfectly understand us, because we understand that no one will perfectly get to someone else. Um, I just wanted to give this as an example of uh, something that can help many people. I've seen help people be able to empathize, say, I'm using the same-sex marriage as an as a example, but I, this applies across the board in religious freedom. I just know that it's on people's minds because of the recent Supreme Court decision. Um, many Latter-day Saints uh, who are trying to struggle to understand why people feel the way they do about sexual orientation, about same-sex marriage. I think this is a website that the LDS Church has created to try and, as it, it says, um, have conversations, um, difficult conversations, right? Having conversations with leaders, church leaders, church members who experience same-sex attraction, um, conversations with the loved ones of gay spouses, children, or grandchildren who are dealing with these issues. Um, that's one example, but there's many more examples of trying to empathize and understand and at least start talking and listening to each other, um, especially when it's hard. Now many of you may say uh, some of these issues came out earlier in another session where people were talking about things that they felt very strongly about that, well, this listening is all very nice, but it's not advocacy. Um, I mean, I'd argue that it is, that that's the first step of advocacy is preparing the ground so that what you say is actually meaningful and worthwhile. Um, and when the right time comes, ad effective advocacy requires speaking directly about what matters most. Being able to explain where you're coming from, be honest about your perspective and where you, how you got there. Um, people may not understand a lot about religious freedom, but if you can explain to them that it's important to you, you can say it's changed, my faith has changed my life, and so I've seen that in other people as well, that it's important to me to protect religious freedom for that reason. And then perhaps going on and saying something like, can you help me understand how you see this situation, how you see it differently, instead of expecting people to affirm, they go on. Um, we heard today some really interesting stories about the Utah Legislative Compromise. Um, I think what's interesting is that this takes time, the members of the LDS leadership and um, uh, same-sex supporters in Utah were talking for six years before this legislative compromise came together. Um, and it started, as I understand it, with protests being held on church land and some people who cared about both sides trying to bring people together. It takes... So Dealing with religious freedom will not be easy. People have very deep feelings. It may take time. It takes problem solving. It takes thinking out of the box. It takes continued effort at listening and listening and talking and listening. Um, I 
And even then, it, sometimes you can't find solutions and you deal with what options you have, whether it's going to court or having civil disobedience or whatever the case is. But but continuing to talk and work sometimes is the only way to continue to find a solution. Well, I've been suggesting that civil dialogue and friendship are the most effective ways to advocate for religious freedom, especially with a set of repeat players, people you see over and over again, long term, they have, you have long term relationships with, although the principles apply for one term relationships or comments on social media. Um, and I am grateful for my friends and of many faiths, of many political persuasions and the ways they've influenced me for good. But because I care deeply about religious freedom and I am grateful for the religious freedom that I have here at, being at Brigham Young University, I wanted to, um, to close my presentation with comments by general leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I think what's interesting, there's a lot of them and I apologize for that in some ways, but in some ways I don't because I think the sheer number of comments of apostles and prophets and the women who serve with them on the councils of the church itself is a message that this is something that matters and it's hard or we wouldn't be keep <laughs> needing to be told it. So at any rate, I'm going to run through these and I hope they'll be of interest to you. To me, they're very inspiring. This is something I deeply believe in and I sustain the men we listen to as prophets, seers and apostles and, and, apostles, and I'm grateful for the women leaders that they chose and they support as well. Love this quote, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland. I know of no more important ability and no greater integrity for us to demonstrate than to walk that careful path, taking a moral stand according to what God has declared and the laws he has given, but doing it compassionately and with understanding and with great charity. No more important ability and greater integrity. It's hard. Defend your beliefs with courtesy and compassion, but defend them. Elder Cook. There are some who feel that venting their personal anger or deeply held opinions is more important than conducting themselves as Jesus Christ lived and taught. I invite each one of us to recognize that how we disagree is a real measure of who we are and whether we truly follow the Savior. Another quote. Let me be clear that all voices need to be heard in the public square. Neither religious nor secular voices should be silenced. Furthermore, we should not expect that because some of our views emanate from religious principles, they will automatically be accepted or given preferential status. But it's also clear that such views and values are entitled to be reviewed on their own merits. As you participate in the public square, regardless of the media involved, remember who you are, your Latter-day Saints, or people of other faith. Where possible, be peacemakers. Explain your beliefs in gentle, loving terms. Be wise, thoughtful, considerate, and friendly. Sister Bonnie Oscarson, Gen Young Women General President. Let us be defenders of marriage as the Lord has ordained it, while continuing to show love and compassion for those with differing views. We have all committed to be disciples of Jesus Christ, and this discipleship should be at the heart of all that we do. Each of us is in a different place in our spiritual journey. Those who are struggling for whatever reason should be able to find within our sisterhood a spirit of warmth, inclusion, and love. It is important to remember the Savior's message of leaving the 99 safely in the fold and reaching out with love, with kindness, and with compassion to the one. We can demonstrate that compassion by ensuring that our communications with one another are respectful and kind. Elder Perry. We must show mutual respect for others and treat all civilly. No one should be belittled for following their moral conscience. Elder Nelson, while we are to emulate our Savior's kindness and compassion, while we are to value the rights and freedom feelings of all God's children, we cannot change his doctrine. It is not ours to change. His doctrine is ours to study, understand, and uphold. Elder Bednar, we in our messages should seek to edify and uplift rather than to argue, debate, condemn, or belittle. As Paul counseled the Ephesians, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace to the hearers. Elder Oaks. On the subject of public discourse, we should all follow the gospel teachings and love our neighbor and avoid contention. Followers of Christ should be examples of civility. We should love all people, be good listeners, and show concern for their sincere beliefs. 
Though we may disagree, we should not be disagreeable. Our stands and communications on controversial topics should not be contentious. When our positions do not prevail, we should accept unfavorable results graciously and practice civility with our adversaries. In any event, we should be persons of goodwill towards all, rejecting persecution of any kind, including persecution based on race, ethnicity, religious belief or non-belief, and differences in sexual orientation. This is Sister Margaret Lifford, who recently stepped down as first counselor in the primary general presidency. Ask yourself these questions. How do I respond to others with whom I disagree in matters of religion, lifestyle, or politics? As parents and leaders exemplify and teach respect for others, we confirm in the hearts of our children that each of us is truly a child of God and we are all brothers and sisters through eternity. We will focus on the things we have in common, the qualities of heart that bind the family of God together rather than on our differences. Elder Ballard. If neighbors become testy or frustrated because of some disagreement with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or with some law we support for moral reasons, please don't suggest to them, even in a humorous way, that they consider moving someplace else. I cannot comprehend how any member of our church could even think such a thing. Our pioneer ancestors were driven from place to place by uninformed and intolerant neighbors. They experienced extraordinary hardship and persecution because they thought, acted, and believed differently from others. If our history teaches us nothing else, it should teach us to respect the rights of all people to peacefully coexist with one another. There are a lot of these, aren't there? Sorry. Elder Ballard again. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. That is what Jesus taught his disciples through the parable of the Good Samaritan. And that is what he's teaching us today through living prophets and apostles. Love one another. Be kind to one another despite our deepest differences. Treat one another with respect and civility. Elder Hales. Brothers and sisters, we are responsible to safeguard the sacred freedoms and rights for ourselves and our posterity. What can you and I do? Live your life to be a good example of what you believe in word and deed. How we relive our religion is far more important than what we may say about our religion. Sister Neil F. Marriott. This is from the church press conference where she spoke with some apostles on same-sex marriage and religious freedom issues. We're at our best as fellow citizens when the push-pull of different viewpoints, freely and thoroughly aired in national debate, lead ultimately to compromise and resolution, and we move on as a nation stronger than before. The debate we speak of today is how to affirm rights from some without taking away from the rights of others. On one side of the debate, we have advocates of LGBT rights. This movement arose after centuries of ridicule, persecution, and even violence against homosexuals. Ultimately, most of society recognized that such treatment was simply wrong, and that such basic human rights as securing a job or a place to live should not depend on a person's sexual orientation. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believes that sexual relations other than between a man or a woman who are married are contrary to the laws of God. This commandment and doctrine comes from sacred scripture, and we are not at liberty to change it. But God is loving and merciful. His heart reaches out to all of us, it reaches out to all of his children equally, and he expects us to treat each other with love and fairness. There's ample evidence in the life of Jesus Christ to demonstrate that he stood firm for living the laws of God, yet reached out to those who had been marginalized even though he was criticized for doing so. Racial minorities, women, the elderly, people with physical and mental disabilities, and those with unpopular occupations all found empathy from the savior of mankind. It's for this reason that the church has publicly favored laws and ordinances that protect LGBT people from discrimination in housing and employment. Elder Anderson. A special concern should be, to us should be those who struggle with same-sex attraction. It is a whirlwind of enormous velocity. I want to express my love and admiration for those who courageously confront this spiral of faith and stay true to the commandments of God. But everyone, independent of his or her decisions and beliefs, deserves our kindness and consideration. The Savior taught us to love not only our friends, but also those who disagree with us, and even those who repudiate us. He said, for if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? And if ye you salute your brethren only, what do you do more than others? 
In the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is no place for ridicule, bullying, or bigotry. Elder El Todd Christopherson speaking to LES lawyers on religious freedom. We need you to speak up, to express your views and defend the faith. And we need you to do so with respect for the beliefs of others and with dignity and decency as disciples of Jesus Christ. And just as important, you must live your faith so that others will see your good works, experience your genuine friend, love and friendship, and feel the Spirit working through you. Because as they do, they will want to listen to you. Elephants, huh? They will want to listen to you and understand when you say your religious freedom is being abridged. They may not agree with you or even understand entirely the issue that is so important to you. But if they know you and respect you because you are a true disciple of Christ, they will be far more inclined to work towards a solution that respects the religious freedoms of both you and the church. First presidency statement that is being read in church meetings across the U.S. and Canada this month. The gospel the gospel of Jesus Christ teaches us to love and treat all people with kindness and civility, even when we disagree. We affirm that those who avail themselves of laws or court rulings authorizing same-sex marriage should not be treated disrespectfully. President Uchtdorf, because love is the great commandment, it ought to be the center in all of everything we do in our own family, in our church callings, and in our livelihood. Perhaps in our religious freedom advocacy. Love is the power that initiates friendship, tolerance, civility, and respect. It's a source that overcomes divisiveness and hate. Love should be our walk and our talk. We must realize that all of God's children wear the same jersey. Our team is the brotherhood of man. This mortal life is our playing field. Our goal is to learn to love God and to extend that same love towards our fellow man. On marriages and families, President Eyring, the change that is needed to create a renaissance of successful marriages and family life is in people's hearts more than their minds. The most persuasive logic will not be enough unless it helps soften hearts. President Monson, may we begin now this very day to express love to all of God's children, whether they be our family members, our friends, mere acquaintances, or total strangers. As we arise each morning, let us determine to respond with love and kindness to whatever might come our way. Amongst them. My earnest prayer is that you'll have the courage to refrain, required to refrain from judging others, and the courage to stand firm for truth and righteousness. See that message from several of them. They come together. As you do so, you will be an example of the believers, and your life will be filled with love and peace and joy. Final comment. May we be a little kinder and a little more thoughtful. May we reach out in helpfulness not only to our fellow members, but also to those who are not of our faith. As we associate with them, may we show our respect for them. I just wanted to close with a story that President Hinckley told. He said, let me see if I can get this right. I didn't plan on this part, but um, was told to him by a rabbi in Jerusalem who had been told it by a Muslim. It's a story of two children who come to their rabbi and they say because of the the obligations they have religious obligations they have that start when it's dark they wanted to know when it would be dark so they said rabbi rabbi how do we know or when the day starts when the dark is over and the light has come he says well it's when you can take a one of my dark hairs and one of my light hairs and hold them up and you can't see the difference. And then they ask again, Rabbi, Rabbi, how can we know when the dark will be over and when the light has come and when it's day? And he says, well, when you can look in the distance and you see a sheep and a goat and you can tell the difference between the sheep and the goat, that's when you know that the, light, the dark is over and the light has come. And they ask again, they say, Rabbi, Rabbi, how can we know the dark is over and the light has come? He says, when you look in the distance and you see a man and a woman and you say, that is my brother, that is my sister, then you will know the dark is over and the light has come. Thank you.
Well, thanks to all. We've had a wonderful and long day. Thanks to Elizabeth for that uh, presentation. Uh, we do technically start at 10 to 9 tomorrow morning. This is in part, so we will really have started by 9. But I'm chairing this early session, so I hope it will not be a totally empty room. And uh, we'll have, well, it's, it's really 9 o'clock that matters, but we really need to start a little before to be, to be on time. So thanks for being with us today. I think it's been a great day, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.